Now, um, we arrive at a uh, fifth session on value systems and economic problems. Before that, allow me to introduce our speaker. Prof. Mohamad Nazari Ismail is a professor at the Faculty of Business and Accounting, University of Malaya, Kuala Lumpur, and a former dean of the faculty until June 2015. He obtained his Bachelor of Economics from University of Wales, United Kingdom, followed by MBA from State University of New York and PhD from Manchester Business School, University of Manchester. Without further ado, I would like to invite Prof. Nazari to present his lecture. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Innal hamdulillah, nahmadu wa nasta'inu wa nasta'afiruhu wa natubu ilaihi wa na'udhu billahi min shuruhi anfusina wa min sayyati a'malina man yahdihillahu falamudillalah وَمَنْ يُدْلُوا فَلَا هَادِيَ لَهُ أَشْهَدُ أَنْ لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا اللَّهُ وَحْدَهُ لَا شَرِيكَ لَهُ وَأَشْهَدُ أَنَّ سَيِّدَنَا مُحَمَّدًا عَبْدُهُ وَرَسُولُهُ اللَّهُمَّ صَلِّ عَلَى سَيِّدِنَا مُحَمَّدٍ وَعَلَى آلِهِ وَصَحْبِهِ أَجْمَعِينَ مَدَمْ تَيْمَنْ دَكْتَرْ فَرُوْقُ بَنَوِيْسَ on the topic of uh, value systems and economic problems. <coughs> I go straight to the subject matter. Uh, in uh, 2008, uh, many of us can still recall that um, there was a crisis uh, in the US which was very serious and uh, later on caused economic problems all over the world, uh, Europe and later on the rest of the world, and, that's, and, and the episode was then called the Great Recession. And um, <coughs> what happened, we will try to recall again, was quite um, straightforward. There was a low interest uh, rate situation in the U.S. in the 1990s. And the reason is, uh, there's a reason for that. There was supposed to be a, a crash in the U.S. after the dot-com crisis. Uh, but the, uh, Alan Greenspan at that time was trying to make sure that the U.S. economy didn't slow down. So he decided to uh, encourage people to borrow money and spend, and therefore there was a low interest situation. Uh, actually, it was after 2000. And then uh, this resulted in many people borrowing money, and, uh, and uh, many people invested in the property market. And these borrowers include what we call subprime borrowers, those who were not very strong financially. And then this uh, caused a housing boom. Everybody got excited and they borrowed more money to invest in properties. And they were very confident that uh, they were they were protected because of the, the increase in the value of the properties, which if they sell their property, they can make money from, from, the, from that investment. And they uh, collateralized that obligation uh, financial instrument, which was introduced in the U.S. banking system, which was very complicated, but which over there people were very smart, those who came up from the business school, especially from the finance department. They came up with this instrument which allowed the banks to sell all these contracts, eh, these housing loan contracts, to investors all over the world. And furthermore, they can actually uh, cut, they call it slice and dice. In, in other words, they can actually categorize all these contracts into various categories depending on the riskiness level, uh, which allow investors to choose which one they want to invest. Those which are most risky will generate more return. So this uh, allowed the bank to get more investment. People borrow more money, and then they, they sold these contracts, and then they, they got basically more money, uh, what's called quality asset, which they can then use for loaning, uh, lending more money to the market, which therefore act as a booster to the whole credit market in the U.S. Um, 
the housing prices skyrocketed, interest rates, uh, and and because the housing prices were so was so high and and the property market was so hot, uh, the U.S. Federal Reserve was getting more worried, and Alan Greenspan then decided to increase interest rate and. This led to a housing crash, as we know. Long story, it's a long story, but at time to reduce it into a couple of sentences. But what happened was there was a crash and borrowers went bust. And people then realized actually at that time, there was a big problem in, in the US economy. And the most important thing was, the most important feature of the economy at that time was, there was a huge amount of debt to GDP of 300% more than 300%, and 20% of total economic output in Europe and the US was just used to pay interest on the loans uh, from the banks. That shows how big uh, the debt bubble was in the US at that time. So uh, what happened was, many people couldn't pay back their loans, and, and therefore the many banks went bankrupt. And many banks were very worried about lending money to borrowers. And because the US economy was such that everybody borrow money in order to spend, companies borrow money in order to carry out operations. So when they are not able to borrow, the, econ the whole economy slowed down. And this led to what's called the Great Recession. Very serious one, 16.3 trillion was wiped out from the global financial market during the period. Some people uh, who do not really understand the financial market will be wondering, when you talk about 16.3 trillion wipeout, what happened to the money? Right? What happened to the money? Where did it go? Uh, many people don't realize that money last time and money now is very different. Money last time was gold and silver. So they, money last time cannot disappear. They were physical things. But now, Money nowadays is just actually IOU, basically a record of debts. It was created by banks. So if you cannot pay the debt, then the money simply disappears. So 16.3 trillion can just wipe out just like that, it disappears because it's not physical. Uh, this is something which, uh, which many people don't, don't really realize. They think it's somebody, somebody else's pocket. Basically, it dis just disappears from the system. And then uh, this caused a global economic downturn and many US financial institutions went bankrupt, badly hit, which caused the real sector also to be affected. And the most famous were the American auto manufacturers, including General Motors, which had to be salvaged by the US government, uh, which created a funny situation because the government in the US, as you know, the US always prides itself as being free market, government that get, doesn't get involved in business. Now it's, it was forced to get involved in business to rescue General Motors, but otherwise there were millions who would be out of job. And General Motors, even though the name is GM, some people say at that time was no longer General Motors, but government motors, because government owed lot of shares in the company. But anyway, so many Americans uh, suffered. So if you go to America at that time, even now actually, we will discuss about that later. These are the common scenes that you see in America. A lot of people on the street, even young people without jobs. And across the whole United States, <coughs> many people were homeless because they couldn't pay back the loans to the, uh, to the, the lenders and they were forced out. But it was in the US, it's called foreclosure. So incidents of foreclosures were very rife. Many people basically lost their homes and forced to go on the street. And uh, this is a typical scene where a police officer will oversee an eviction or a foreclosure uh, because uh, to make sure that the people who were involved did not get violent. Otherwise, they can get violent and the representative of the housing company or the financial company who, uh, which uh, issued the notice to get them out, they may be attacked. So a policeman was necessary to be present. So this is a very sad situation. 
that took place over there, and many Americans were very worried about. So at, at the moment now, even now, many Americans are basically worried about their situation, about the economy. Having a PhD, for example, is not necessary. It's not necessarily a guarantee of a good job. Uh, so you can see people walking around in the U.S. saying they have got PhDs but not able to find a job. Something for us to think about, because uh, if our economy is the same structure and follow the same pattern as the U.S. economy, then one day having a PhD also may not mean much for you here, young people in this country. But the pattern is the same, actually, already there, because uh, last time you can get, if you have a master's, you can get a job as a lecturer in university. Now, a master is not, it's not enough to be a lecturer, you need a PhD. Last time, you don't even need a master to be a, uh, to be a lecturer, you only need a university degree. Then you need a master. Now, you must have a PhD. And now, actually, even a PhD is not necessary, you can find a job uh, in many universities in well, in Eastern Malaya, we will look at your PhD first, from which university you got your PhD. So, in other words, we are following the same path as the United States, and the implication and the outcome is almost the same also. Uh, interesting comment by Professor Robert Jensen from University of Texas in Austin. He said, we need to recognize that the crisis that we are uh, having, uh, that we face are not simply the result of greedy corporate executives or corrupt politicians, but rather of failed systems. So this is one difference between probably Malaysia and United States because everything is very transparent over there. They know how much at that time was Obama was the president. They know how much Obama's uh, salary was, how much money he makes, and whether his wife uh, used money from public fund or private fund to buy handbags or uh, rings, right? So people were not worried about Obama stealing money from the public coffers. So the issue over there is not about corrupt politicians compared to some other countries. But so they were very clear. They know it's not about corrupt politicians. Also, interesting, also not about greedy corporate executives. He said the thing that the word that he used there was failed systems. So he realized the professor and many others realized that they have a problem with the system over there. And this is something which we also must think. If they, if they have a problem of systems over there, failed systems, what are the, nat the features of the failed systems in the US which we also must make sure that those features are not present in our own systems? Otherwise, we will probably experience the same kind of trouble, even if we get rid of corrupt politicians. At the moment, everybody is focused on corrupt politicians because that is what, uh, what dominates the discussion. But we seem to forget that there's another problem of, of the system itself. <coughs> and then uh, 2011, there was an uh, Occupy movement, as you know, in the US, uh, in uh, Zuccotti Park in uh, New York, where this is during Obama's time. He, uh, he, he, just, he just became president. And everybody was suffering, and they got upset. I don't know, some of you may forget, forgot about this already. Uh, uh, thousands of them actually congregated in New York City. And they, uh, they call it Occupy Wall Street in the Zuccotti Park, which is very near to Wall Street, the center of finance in the US. And they want to, they, they were complaining that the system was benefiting 99% of people, and 1% is actually, uh, sorry, benefiting only 1%, and 99% were suffering. So they said, we must change the system. We are fed up. We want the thing to be changed so that everybody will have equal access to wealth and opportunity. Okay. So they were there for a couple of months, about two months actually. Um, living in tents, sleeping rough, and refusing to move until the system changed. See, they will not move until the system changed. And then this protest spread throughout the cities of America, San Francisco, Los Angeles, and actually also to other countries, including to Europe, as well as in Kuala Lumpur, where there were some students who occupied the Dataran Merdeka, occupied Dataran, call it. 
So you, these are some of these people sleeping on the, on the streets in Zukoti Park in New York City, and wanting to pressure the society to make changes. But this is the reality. You want to change the system, you cannot change the system by just protesting, camping and shouting that it will not change a flawed system. You have to do something more than that. And you must understand what is the nature of the flawed system first before you, want to, you can make changes. So uh, this is the thing that the protesters in, the, in New York City didn't quite realize. This is something we hopefully can discuss after this. Eventually, the people got fed up because they were, the, the situation was not very hygienic. Rubbish everywhere. And then, uh, plus on top of that, you have young people sleeping rough, very near to each other, of course, with hormones among young people. There was sexual assault also taking place among the protesters. So uh, the police had to come in, and, and of course the mayor was very worried, Bloomberg was very worried because he could get into trouble. So he called the police, and the police came and, and forcibly uh, removed the protesters from Zukoti Park. Right. They were all removed uh, within one night, very violent. But I understand what happened in Dr. Merdeka was worse than this. At least in New York City, the people who came were in uniform. In Dr. Merdeka, the people who came were in dark, red, huh? red shirt, black shirt actually. Nobody knew who they were, but they came and they were uh, like gangsters. Kick and uh, what punch all the students and they all were forced out. And, and nobody uh, admitted to be responsible for doing that, but people suspect it was the authority. Anyway, the Americans end up on the street again. So you can see all over US now, people who are homeless. All over the cities in America, and of course over there it's worse because when winter comes, you can die of, of cold weather. This is a typical scene outside many American cities now, people living in tents. Okay. That's the reason why, according to some, some analysts, why Donald Trump managed to win. Because many Americans, especially white-collared, non-educated Americans, thought that they were fed up. They were fed up of two terms of Donald Trump. Still, things didn't change. So they say we need some, something, re, something new, and maybe Donald Trump can do something about it. Donald Trump is, wasn't uh, at that time. He was not. A politician. He was a businessman, and he he was a successful uh, businessman. He could, he became rich, so people thought that he can actually make people rich. And of course, he he said things which were very popular. He said, "I will make sure that you can get your jobs. I make sure that the Mexicans who are here, I push them out so that there will be more jobs for Americans." He made it sound so simple. Actually, the situation is more complex than that. Anyway, because of his uh, messages, which were very simple. He was elected by uh, foolish, I would say, Americans who thought that he could uh, make things better for them. But now you have more than uh, 50 million people now probably who are living in poverty in the US, about 70% now probably. Uh, this is using relative poverty <coughs> definition, 60% of median income. Uh, again, remind ourselves again what Robert Jensen said failed system. Another professor, very famous, Noam Chomsky, he said, the system is not working. So now he's admitting the system is not working. Okay, what is that system that is not working? What is the features? What about Japan? Let's go to Japan. A country with, <coughs> which is very successful in terms of, many people think, successful. A country, successful exporter, a lot of trade surplus, very high savings rate, very hardworking and skillful workers. So maybe, they, maybe Japan don't have this kind of problems. Is Japan a success story? You go and walk around the streets of Tokyo, you will see these images. A lot of people who are actually also homeless, thousands of them. Living in the streets, okay? Worse than in Malaysia, this is under a train station in, in in Osaka or in Tokyo, all right. 
queuing for food. So this is in Tokyo, by the way, very rich country, successful exporter. How come? What's happening? So many people who are, these are not, these are not tsunami victims. Huh? These are actually homeless people who do not have their own homes and no jobs, not enough income. Uh, this is below a train station in Osaka. This is uh, villages, homeless villages in Osaka. These are the typical uh, tens of homeless people in Tokyo. Along the river banks. And we found out actually almost 60% of Japanese are poor. Uh, which is just below the average in, in the US. So what's happening? I thought, we thought that Japan is actually a successful country. So something is also not right with the system in Japan. So what is, the th what is it about the Jap American and the Japanese economy? Have, have we really thought about it? How are we going to make sure that our country can avoid the mistakes that, are, that have been committed uh, in the US and in Japan? queuing for food. And this is the situation over there. Many people now in Japan, young people are actually temporary workers, temps they call them. They, are, they have got contracts for two months, six months. So because of that, they are not able to, uh, not willing to buy a property or rent a house, rent an apartment because they are not sure of their situation. Of course, they will not get married because it's very, very uncertain. So they, they stay in. Internet. So you have thousands of young Japanese people now living in internet cafes. Not internet, internet cafes, sorry. Yeah. Uh, small little cubicle. Not even a cubicle actually. Very small space, probably just a bit wider than this table here. Uh, the wall is just above your head, so it's not up to the, to the ceiling. So there is no privacy. You can hear people snoring or typing on their computers. Because I read about their living situation. Uh, this is their permanent homes. They don't, have, they don't have any other homes. So why? Why is this thing happening in Japan? Have we, uh, have we uh, considered the possible reason and what should we do in order to make sure that our young people in the future will not end up staying in tents or in internet cafes because Japan is also sort of our model of economic development because Pandang Timur so what we say we want to, to develop like Japan have we said anything about except for this and except for that did we say anything about that so far that I know nobody said anything about we want to we are not going to do this what Japan Japanese did or we are not going to do what the American did Right? We are going headlong along the same path of development as Japan and the United States. Again, this non Tonsu guy said the system is not working. What about Singapore? Down south. More, world's most expensive city. You see, people actually, there are also homeless people in Singapore. Under, this is one of them, under the flyover there. So you can read slippers in the city of Singapore. So actually the, the problems also exist in Singapore. In fact w probably worse because we don't see this in, uh, I'm not sure, maybe I, I've, I've not done any uh, what uh, check up of the our Subang airport, but Subang airport, but uh, I eat? But this is in Changi airport. Homeless people in Changi airport. And everywhere in parks, in uh, what? Near buildings in Singapore, yeah? This is a Singapore reporter. And now we, go, we come back to KL. Actually, we are also experiencing the same thing now. Right? Homeless people now in, in KL, living in the streets. And we now realize many young people are having financial problems, have committed suicides. This one is a very famous case. Last year, I think, no, no 2016, people, the guy, young guy, jumped from Penang Bridge because of financial problem. He wasn't very happy with the, he was very upset with the unjust situation it says, which is uh, existing in Malaysia now. So uh, suicide is very common everywhere. 
But if you start reading around, you find that actually the problems everywhere in the world. Argentina, Brazil, Europe, right? And they all have the same problem also, which is the cost of living. That's why they cannot afford to stay in, uh, <coughs> to stay in proper housing. They, they cannot afford to get married because of cost of living, right? Now, let's take a look. This is the inflation rate. I want to make it quite simple, not technical. This is the Malaysian Consumer Price Index. Up and up and up and up. 2000 and this is 2006, 2016. Okay, so we have uh, inflation at the moment, uh, which is which seems to be quite steady there. I'm sure this is the Malaysian bank's balance sheet. See or not? Also steady. So as banks grow the cost of living also goes up. Right. This is something you want to bear in, bear in mind. Now, our bank's balance sheet is actually, uh, this is 2016, 2017, probably now about 3 trillion assets. What is the most important category of assets for banks? For those who are not familiar with banking, the most important category of assets for banks are Loans, unpaid loans. That is actually the most important category of assets for banks. So as loans grow, then bank assets will also grow. And then at the same time we saw just now, the inflation also will go up. Why? Because when banks' assets grow, the loans grow, another thing that also grow will be money supply. Because when banks lend money, they also create money. This is uh, something which also some people don't really, are not very familiar. Money, as I said just now, is no longer physical things as um, gold and silver. Money is actually now records of loans given out by banks. So money supply, only some people think that money is created by Ben Nagara. That is actually a misunderstanding. Ben Nagara only creates base money which is only 3% of the money supply in our economy. The 97% is actually supply created by the commercial banks. And how do commercial banks create this money? When they lend out money. When they lend out, lend out money, you see the loans grow up just now. And also the asset go, goes up. So this is the graph of money supply. And this is the, this is the reason why you see inflation goes up. Why cost of living goes up all the time. So this is the graph of the Malaysian loans to the private sector. That's how you see the graph goes up also. This is only private sector. It doesn't include, it does not include uh, household. Household debt you now in Malaysia is one trillion. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay, bank assets is not only not only uh, uh, not only the loans, it's some other things. Ah, this is this is the real cash. Yeah. This is the they call it um um there are categories of uh hmm. Ah, okay, okay. The, the point is there are assets of different categories of banks. Uh, money supply is just one of it. Uh, when, when banks create loans, you have uh, one category of assets of banks, which is uh, people who are uh, in debt to the banks. But banks may have other assets also. Uh, that could be... Uh, 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 uh-huh, yeah. Uh, yeah, uh, the point is that it's still asset to the bank. Lah. Okay. <laughs> okay. Yeah. There are different categories of assets, right? Okay. Okay. So now, um, uh, this is something which uh, uh, will be technical. Some people say that banks only lend money that is actually deposited in banks. L they lend out money from deposits that people put in the banks. 
This is, I got this from the Bank of England, eh? uh, which explained the mechanism of modern banking. He said, whenever a bank makes a loan, it simultaneously creates a matching deposit in the borrower's bank account, thereby creating new money. The reality of how money is created today differs from the description found in some economic textbooks. Rather than banks receiving deposits when households save and then lending them out, bank lending actually creates deposit. Okay? So actually, when banks, this is, this is not what I say, eh? this is actually, uh, you can, you can uh, take it down, I can send to you by email. So this is actually what Bank of England described the uh, modern banking mechanism. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, uh, so now, says, uh, so when people look, people think that banks play a, a very important role in the economy because they channel the intermediary of funds from the depositors, they lend it to uh, to people who need funds, businesses or whatever, consumers. But actually, the deposit that is in the bank is actually created from from the loans. They they lend money, so accounting wise, that lending. It's also recorded as deposit in the bank. So the loans create deposit. So it's not the other way around. Uh, so this is actually uh, explained by the Bank of England. Some, uh, I discussed with my banker friend. He, he wasn't quite, he didn't know. They actually, a marine director of a bank, personal friend. You may know him. Uh, this is Datuk Manap Wahab, ex-CEO of Bank Amalat. He said, I, did, I was a CEO of he didn't know that before. Now he, he said, this is the situation. He's, and you can invite him to give a real detailed explanation. And this includes, this mechanism principle also applies to Bank Islam. Which is Islamic banking, the same. Right? So now, uh, if you read uh, recently, uh, announcement by, by CIMB Bank, they say now, uh, you have loan deposit ratio, which was supposed to be maintained by banks. But now they say we don't, we don't actually pay much attention to that now because uh, the deposit of people save money in banks, that is high quality deposits. But they call it high quality uh, uh, asset for banks. But, but if you want to wait, if banks want to wait for people to deposit, then that will slow down, slow down their business. So what banks do is they issue, they issue uh, bonds. And then they issue bonds, they, they get money, and from that, that will be part of their, uh, what? their asset, which they then use to be a basis for their loans. So that's how they create more loans, in order to make more loans to make more money. So they don't really wait for uh, deposit by depositors now. Okay, so, so now you have the phenomenon of inflation all over the world. This is, I got figures for Asian countries going up all the time. So, so this is what I'm trying to share with you today, my analysis. Eh? Economic system that encourages the growth of debt is the cause of the problem. So we have one of the things that we must understand is that the cause of the problem in the U.S. just now, I started off explaining the debt amount in the U.S. and then the, uh, in Europe. And also in Japan, it's the same thing, actually. Same thing, we've got to practice the same system. Actually, uh, what happened was there was huge a debt problem prior to the 1989 crisis in Japan. As you know, Japan, Japanese economy crashed in 1989 and has never recovered since then. Uh, up to 2009, it was called the lost, uh, 1989 to 1999, it was called lost decade. And then 2009, two lost decades. Now 2019 coming up, we have 30, uh, what, 30 years of uh, what, uh, stagnant, almost stagnant economy in, the, in Japan. So economic system that encourages the growth of debt is the cause of the problem. So we need a model of economic development that is independent of debt-based financial industry. Okay, so this is what we have to think about because this is the feature of modern economy of countries now. That is all based on debt. Last time, it wasn't, wasn't based on debt. People work hard based on money that's available. Of course, the rate of growth is a bit slower, but steady. But now, you can have a fast economic growth. For example, Asian countries in 1999, 
sorry 1995 early 90s mid 90s was very fast uh, indonesia was about 10% malaysia was about 8% population growth probably uh, maybe 3% population growth but economic growth was about 8% why did, how did they get this growth from easy the banking system lend money to companies and everybody uh, to to various sectors including government and to household so everybody start consuming and then get engaged in economic activities but the debt level went up as well and the debt level was the one that caused the crisis in bangkok first and then indonesia later on and then we have the asian financial crisis so the economic the fast economic growth cannot be sustained because it's based on debt and that's what happened to uh, to the us in 2007 actually the same thing happened in the way back in 1989 as I said in Japan. Same thing, property market, stock market boom because of borrowed money. But people don't seem to be able to get out of the same pattern. So what happened was the same thing then happened in the US. And then the same thing happened in, the, in Europe. And now what we are going to witness is it's going to happen again in, well, it's, it's inevitable it's going to happen in this country too just with a matter of time so we need a model of economic development independent of debt based financial industry but that's not going to be easy because we always talk about fast economic growth everybody wants fast economic growth and you if you want fast economic growth if you slow down debt then economic growth will slow down people don't get people are not very happy if economy slow down so they are sort of threat threat in that kind of mode and then when we think about development, it's only understood in material terms. So when we talk about development, it's all about materials. So we want to see more things being produced, etc., etc. So we are in that kind of mode of thinking. It's difficult for us to move up. Our materialistic values are very strong. For example, when people buy cars, they want the, the latest model, right? even though they can't afford it. Loan probably nine years. It doesn't matter. Young people, they. they just got a job, straight away they go and buy a brand new car, uh, 100,000 ringgit, which will make them in debt, be in debt for 10 years, they don't mind, because they want to keep up with their friends, they don't want to buy a second hand for cash. So that kind of materialistic value is very strong. They want to buy, they are in a hurry to buy a property, uh, maybe because they want to invest, maybe they want to make sure that friends do not look down upon them, relatives do not look down upon them, they want to have a property. Actually, it's a debt for another 40 years, right? So again, it's, if you have that kind of mentality, it's very, very difficult to get out of this, <coughs> this kind of uh, system. So we see now, household debt increased to almost 90% in 2015 in Malaysia. That is about 1 trillion, eh? 1.03 trillion. This is more, people complain about government debt of about coming up close to 700 billion now. That is house government debt. Household debt is more than one trillion. So if you divide by the uh, prop, uh, population of Malaysia per head, you will see how many, how many thousands per head. It's more than one trillion, 1, 000, more than 1,000 billion. Uh, most are for property. Uh, and then you have personal loans also. Okay. Now, this is Malaysia household debt. Uh, 2015. 33,000 per head. This includes babies and orang asli. Yeah? Uh, if you actually, if you buy a, a car straight away, you are already about 100,000 in debt, right? So when you average out, including children and also uh, orang asli, that you got 33,000. This is uh, uh, the nature of household debt in Malaysia. You can see now, 2015, I have only 2015. I, I showed you just now, it's more than 1 trillion now. Mostly residential and then high purchase probably for cars. Okay. And then, this is, a, this is the story of all over the world. I, I don't have time to talk. I'm talking about, this is the whole system that we're talking about, that, that uh, Robert Jensen was talking about. How the whole thing came about, you have to go back to how the banking industry started, and then how it contributed to industrial revolution, and then mass manufacturing, etc., etc. And then, and then the banking system abandoned the gold standard. They don't want to use gold and silver as money, everything now is on electronic. So that makes it easy for banks to lend money. So all this, this we can discuss it later. 
even the invention of what's called the corporations, very significant because because when you divorce uh, people from their debt obligations, uh, last time, last time there was no corporation, they, just individuals. They call it sole proprietorship and partnership. So you are responsible directly for debt. But what happened was the the British they created. Uh, lawyers will know this. They created a concept which separated the entity. The entity that borrow money is actually separate from the individuals. So you have corporations. So the one that go into debt is not individuals, the corporations. For example, why do banks lend so much money to one MDB? 50 billion, right? Now, balance is about 31 billion now, according to uh, Anru, Anru Kanda said. 31 billion, before that 50 billion. How come they borrow so much money? Because it's not individuals, it's actually one MDB. It's an entity, it's a corporation. So banks are willing to lend because one MDB, even if uh, the person who signed the check dies or is replaced, lose power, one MDB debt is still there, especially if it's granted by the government. So when you have corporations, corporations borrow money, huge amount of money. So this, this entity, uh, plus you can get tax exempt. When, uh, sorry, tax, uh, what? You can, uh, in the accounting, uh, you can expense it. Interest payment is considered expense. And so you can actually uh, uh, reduce your uh, what, tax payment to government by borrowing money instead of sharing it among the uh, invest, uh, owners of companies. Okay, and then long story again. Because of the huge debt problem, you have oppression of the masses. In Europe, during the Industrial Revolution, there were crises. During that time, tulip mania crisis, so many crises that took place in Europe at that time. But people just simply ignore it and continue to proceed with the same model of economic development until today. And, and now you have all the way to Occupy Movement 2011, and then you have this illusion of establishment now. So everybody is now confused. What is actually the model that we want? But the whole problem started all the way back from the time the banking industry started in the 15th, 16th century, and then properly legalized in the 18th century. So, uh, so we are now stuck with the system. Which, now, why, why are people not able to uh, solve unemployment problem? Now you have corporation, which runs the economy, basically. R corporations are highly indebted. They want to, and they are competing against one another. These are large corporations, and they have to make sure their costs are down. How do, you, how do corporations reduce costs? They cannot simply, uh, for example, an aeroplane, an airline, they cannot simply use low quality fuel. They cannot simply use low, uh, low quality materials for their plane, plastic, whatever, right? No, no, it's not possible. The best thing, the way, the thing that people, all companies do in order to reduce costs, what? Reduce human, human, labor, human costs. Reduce um, wages or ask the workers to work harder for the same amount of wage. So by doing that, they don't take more in order to reduce costs. They don't hire people. They ask the existing workers to work harder. That is why graduates, when they come out of universities, they find it difficult to find jobs because companies are forced to reduce costs. They don't want to hire people. They will use existing workers, ask them, ask them to work harder and harder. That's why people come back late at night. And then uh, 7, 8, 9 o'clock is common now, right? And then they don't hire new, new graduates. That's the reason uh, we have unemployment now. We have competition now. Very, very stiff because companies are all indebted. By the way, you know that Toyota, a large company, the debt is about more than 1 trillion USD, you know? Uh, so all these companies are highly indebted and they are under a lot of financial pressure. That is why life is not tough to be managers of large corporations. Very, very tough. Now, you can see the job losses. They don't, when, they, when they are in trouble, it's not one or two jobs that are actually cut. 50,000, 60,000 workers you know, at one go. That's the reason why you have unemployment in the US. Huge measure. <coughs> problem and uh, why people are so upset over there. Okay, uh, okay. I have, I have, uh, companies are forced to watch large scale because in, uh, they have to operate on a large scale because competition is among large scale corporations which borrow a lot of money from banks. So uh, firms who want to dominate must borrow like crazy in order to be strong. So they are now stuck 
if they want to be strong, they have to borrow money to be to compete effectively, right? So that's why uh, the the pattern doesn't change. Look at the amount of debts of firms, right? This is hundreds of billions, eh? hundreds of billions. So you have large go Goliaths uh, who are competing, and therefore they must, they must what? Be efficient. They must borrow more money. At the same time, they must reduce costs. That's why you have unemployment problem, and then you have growth of loans. I, I don't have much time left. I just want to highlight that at the moment we have uh, growth of financial markets, and then uh, economic crisis. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm taking too much time now. I just want to show the growth of debts again, right? Uh, 2007, U.S. government debt was eight. Now it's 20 trillion. Yeah, 2016. Uh, according to Kotrikov, U.S. actually is just bankrupt now because they won't be able to pay back their loans. 20 trillion and growing. So how can they pay back their loans? The U.S. federal government, not including state government. Huh? This is just federal government only. Japan government debt is worse. Huh? 250 percent of GDP. Huh? Uh, U.S. more than 100 percent. Malaysia is about 54, 50 percent of GDP. Japan is 250 percent of GDP. Much worse than us. That's why they are they are now debt basically. Japan will never be able to pay off their debts. According to one economist, they have to increase their GST to 15 percent in order to be able to bring the money in to start paying their debt. Okay. All right, Malaysia. This is the. This is a prediction of Malaysian public debt. It's going to go up to one trillion by 2020. Okay, 1,000 billion, right? 2020. So we also have a big problem here. Okay, and then you have public debt. Yeah, huh? this is 2006 public debt all over the world, 27 trillion. Now 60 trillion. 2016, huh? 2018, I don't know. Probably 70 trillion now. China is also in big trouble, huge debt problem in China. This is China's debt growing like crazy. And according to some people, China will not be able to solve its debt problem also. This is some, some description of debt in China. Okay. Uh, and then, that is the issue I said. And this is what Professor Gonov, Kenneth Rogoff of Harvard said. This is the real problem. Excessive concentration of debt. Global financial assets are all basically three quarters debt instrument. So they say we are now deeply ingrained in debt bias. And the world debt is still increasing. Just now, during the crisis of 2008, the debt level was about 170 trillion. Look at this. 2008. Uh, 2007, 149 trillion. Now 2017, look at that, 217 trillion. So after crisis, after the crisis in the US and Europe, they know that it's a debt problem. What did they do? They increased the debt. <laughs> okay, instead of lowering the debt, the world is actually increasing the debt by another uh, 70 trillion. We are dead. Okay. Is it possible to avoid that? Uh, this is one. We, I, I just want to provoke young people here. Housing, housing debt, uh, household debt, number one is actually house, house purchase. So the guy said, better rent. So this is an expert on opening, property expert. Uh, you can read about Ernest Chong, he said. Met him, old guy. He says, young people, don't be stupid, he said. Don't start borrowing money and invest in properties. Just go and rent, he said. Buy a second-hand car, he said. This is my advice, young people. If you want to avoid that, it's possible, actually. You can buy this, 4900 for a car, right? Then, no, not necessarily. I will tell you why not. This is my car, if you want to buy. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> this is uh, 
3k that was two years ago uh, probably now probably 2k only but uh, <laughs> but i'm still using it i'm still using it so uh, no problem uh, so if you say all this thing about you got to spend a lot of money okay lah let us say let us say it breaks down and then you have to repair the engine let's say engine cost about 3000 ringgit plus 2000 ringgit only 5000 ringgit you borrow if buy a honda city now you know how much it cost honda city it's, somebody told me 92000 okay so let us say 70000 70000 compared to 5000 betul tak even the worst case scenario right you buy you can buy five units of my car five. <laughs> it's still less than buying a, sec, a brand new car right okay you can also cover in budget right if you want to get married it's still possible to avoid borrowing money because people start people borrowing money to get married now don't do that right uh, but you need a different value system i say right because the problem now i said that's why the topic i said just now is actually value system we are in trouble now because our values have changed. We are, we, are, we are having values which makes us very, very vulnerable to the tricks of the financial system. We fall straight into the trap of debt because of our values. So society must adopt values that prevent the growth of debt, and I think it's possible. Thank you very much.